Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I put the handout in the uh, chat box as usual. Let me make sure of that. Okay. Well, uh, we're done with the technical material for uh, the course. Uh, I know it's been it's been a long slog, uh, but it also means there's a lot to digest philosophically, uh, and uh, I hope today will be a big part of that. Uh, we're downstream from this uh, isomorphism that Ulf showed uh, between reason relations as expressed in deontic normative vocabulary, the kind we do our pragmatics in, uh, and those same reason relations expressed in an alethic modal vocabulary, the vocabulary we do our semantics in, uh, at any rate, our truth maker semantics. Remember, gamma implies uh, delta on the bilateral uh, Restall-Ripley approach. If one can't be entitled to commitments to assert everything in gamma and reject everything in delta, and gamma implies delta on the truth maker approach, given Ulf's definition of consequence, if and only if every fusion of truth makers of everything in gamma with false makers of everything in delta uh, is always an impossible state. Now, according to what we call bimodal conceptual realism, that commonality of uh, reason relations is the commonality of conceptual structure that underlies sapient intentionality, the fact that we can think and talk about how things uh, objectively are. Uh, and what our technical apparatus has uh, gotten us, uh, I hope and trust, uh, is uh, a good grip on those reason relations, um, which uh, on the side of subjects show up as vocabularies, lexicons, uh, a lexicon plus uh, a set of real uh, of reason relations. Now we're interested not in the common uh, conceptual content, the role in reason relations uh, that ties together uh, the two poles of the intentional nexus, but rather about what distinguishes them uh, about the two ends uh, of this nexus, the two guises in which conceptual contents can show up objectively as facts uh, and subjectively uh, in the form of commitments that can be made explicit uh, by asserting sentences. So one reason that we're interested in uh, these two, voc two kinds of vocabulary the alethic modal that we talked about last time and the deontic normative is precisely because they articulate uh, not just the common form, but what's distinct uh, about um, the two poles. So uh, we can uh, represent where we are in a picture like this. Uh, we use the lethic modal vocabulary to express reason relations, relations of necessary consequence. Uh, all copper necessarily melts at 1,084 degrees C. Uh, and incompatibilities, uh, no sample of copper. It's impossible uh, for copper to remain uh, solid at 2,000 uh, degrees on the one hand, and the deontic normative vocabulary uh, of commitments and entitlements that we use to understand uh, implications and incompatibilities uh, as they show up in vocabularies in use. Uh, and what we're gonna focus on today is the representational dimension of conceptual content. The fact that uh, there's a relation of aboutness, uh, of reference, of representation 
between items in a vocabulary and the world. Uh, these uh, ovals are all vocabularies, but this one isn't. There's reasons, reason relations in it, but it's uh, the objective world. And uh, there's a representational dimension to uh, the relation between uh, ordinary empirical descriptive base vocabularies, the kind in which we can say the cat's on the mat, the frog is on the log, uh, and uh, the reason relations. Last time we looked at Seller's distinction between labeling and describing, uh, description requiring uh, that uh, the descriptions be situated in a space of implications that included what's made explicit by subjunctive uh, conditionals uh, that makes the descriptions suitable to appear in explanations uh, to provide reasons for uh, and against one another, uh, as opposed to what he called mere labeling. Today, we're going to look at a notion that uh, is in between labeling and describing, namely representing, uh, whose paradigm might be the relation between a map and the terrain that it's uh, a map of, uh, on at least one way of understanding Seller's notion of labeling as involving mere reliable differential responsive dispositions. Uh, the notion of representation, I think, sits between mere labeling and describing. Uh, but I want to talk about what the relationship is between those three, uh, those three sorts uh, of things. Uh, I want to say what representations are, what the representing representation relation is uh, between representings and representeds, uh, and to say uh, uh, what's special about descriptive representations, representations that uh, represent by uh, describing. And one benefit of doing this is that it will uh, keep us from turning the distinction between uh, inferentialist and representationalist orders of semantic explanation, uh, those ones that start uh, with notions of reason relations, that's the kind we've recommended, the implication space semantics is a paradigm of that, on the one hand, and representational uh, semantics like the truth maker semantics, uh, on the other hand, I want to understand that as a distinction of orders of explanation. And whenever you make a distinction, uh, you want to make sure it doesn't turn into a dualism. Uh, that is, it doesn't uh, become drawn in as a distinction in such forms that you can't understand the relation between the distinguished items uh, anymore. And it turns out, uh, I'll claim, that we can learn a lot more about representation by thinking about what's expressed in alethic modal vocabularies and deontic uh, modal vocabularies, deontic normative vocabularies, uh, in addition to the observation that they specify the isomorphic reason relations of world and vocabularies generally. So in order to do this, I want to talk about uh, representation, uh, look briefly, breathlessly at uh, some of the his history of this crucial, distinctively modern uh, concept, uh, because I think the lessons that we learn from uh, uh, at least sketching the history set criteria of adequacy for our uh, account of representation. So uh, the first point is Descartes' invention of the notion of representation. I said this was a distinctively modern discovery. Uh, why is it? Why wasn't the uh, 
traditional Greek and medieval notion, uh, what, why didn't they have a notion of representation? Um, and the claim is that starting with the Greeks, uh, the dominant understanding of the relation between appearance and reality was in terms of resemblance. Uh, won't go far wrong if you think about picturing here, though that term that term has been given specifically representational content in our own times, but the paradigm still is a picture and what it's a picture of. Uh, and by resemblance, I mean uh, a relation like that between a picture and what it's a picture of. Uh, that's a matter of sharing properties. Uh, if it's a good picture, uh, say uh, a portrait, uh, then there'll be a property that is uh, the contour of the nose that is literally shared. It's the same property in the picture as uh, in what's pictured. Uh, if it's a color picture, it's a good color picture insofar as the color is the same uh, on uh, this bit of blue ocean and uh, the picture of it. So the portrait resembles the one portrayed by sharing uh, features of shape and color typically, but texture and so on as well. Uh, and the thought behind the resemblance model is that appearance is veridical insofar as it resembles uh, the reality that it's an appearance of by sharing properties with it. And insofar as it doesn't resemble it, insofar as there's properties that the reality has that uh, uh, the picture doesn't or vice versa, uh, that's then it's a false picture. There's error in that regard. Uh, and thought of in these very broad brushstroke terms, Plato and Aristotle just had different pictures, technical stories about what the properties were that are shared uh, between appearance and reality. Um, you know, are there separable forms uh, or not? Uh, we know the differences and similarities there. The reason representation is a distinctively modern notion is because the rise of modern science made that picture unsustainable. Uh, Copernicus discovered that the reality behind the appearance of a stationary earth and a revolving sun was a stationary sun and a rotating earth. Uh, and there just isn't any shared properties there. Uh, what seemed, what appeared to be at rest turns out to be in motion. Uh, what appeared to be in motion turns out to be at rest, and the motions are different. Uh, uh, revolution as opposed to rotation. So the relation between appearance and reality, we're just not being helped in thinking about it if the only model we've got is resemblance as sharing of some properties. And this got a lot worse, uh, this disconnect between a philosophical picture of how appearance and reality are related in relation to our best appearances of reality in the rising science with Galileo. Uh, you know, he produced a massively effective and productive way of conceiving physical reality uh, the language of nature, he says, is, uh, sorry, the book of nature, he says, is written in the language of geometry. Uh, but to do that, periods of time show up as the lengths of lines. And accelerations of bodies show up as the areas of triangles. The, the notion of resemblance is really no help here. A period of time between those two snaps and the length of a geometrical line, the acceleration of a falling body and the area uh, of a triangle, the notion of a shared property just isn't helpful here. 
There's no antecedently available notion of a property that's shared by these things. And Descartes comes up with the abstract meta-conception of representation that's required to make sense of those scientific achievements and of his own. Oh, and as Spinoza, fabulous reader of Descartes, saw uh, the particular case he generalized from to get a new model of the relations between appearance and reality, mind and world, is the relationship he discovered between algebra and geometry. Because he discovered how to deploy algebra as a massively productive and effective appearance of what following Galileo, he took to be an essentially geometric reality. So he says, look, um, uh, Galileo was right that the world is extended. Uh, that's extended substance. But the mind, uh, as he's reading the analogy, uh, works algebraically by manipulating symbols. Uh, he, he saw that uh, treating something in a linear discursive form, AX plus BY equals C, as an appearance of a Euclidean line, and X squared plus Y squared equals D, as the appearance of a circle, lets you calculate points of intersection geometrically from simultaneous solutions of the equations. Uh, we can see what intersections uh, a circle and a line can have and what intersections particular ones do have and lots more besides. But those symbols don't at all resemble lines and circles. Uh, they're just strings of symbols uh, you wouldn't have any antecedent way of knowing uh, which one was the appearance of a circle, which one the appearance of uh, a line. But his mathematical results uh, showing that you could solve outstanding geometrical problems by turning them into easy algebraic problems and vice versa, uh, showed that algebraic symbols present geometric facts in a way that's not only potentially veridical, but tractable. You, you can uh, understand things you couldn't understand uh, otherwise if you uh, use as your appearance of the geometrical reality this discursive uh, algebraic formulation the trouble is, how do you understand the relation between them? Uh, because there really is no uh, shared uh, properties. And Descartes responded philosophically, uh, coming up with, the, with what amounts to the concept of representation that's more abstract, powerful, and flexible than the resemblance model that it supplanted. But how does it work? Uh, and I think it's best understood the way Spinoza did. Uh, Spinoza worrying about what Descartes did rather than what Descartes said about what he did. I'm thinking of Spinoza's Descartes book here. Uh, he saw that the key to Descartes' philosophy was his algebraizing of geometry. And he saw, I think, more clearly than Descartes himself did, that what his real insight was is what made algebraic understanding of geometrical figures possible is moving from a global isomorphism, sorry, a, a local isomorphism that consists in sharing properties to a global isomorphism between the whole system of algebraic symbols and the whole system of geometrical figures. Spinoza's slogan for that was, the order and connection of things is the same as the order and connection of ideas. Uh, but that's a way of talking about a global isomorphism. Uh, there is a resemblance, there is a sharing of properties, but it's not one by one, it's not atomistic. 
It's not that each uh, idea shares some property with what it's the idea of. It's not that each representing you know, an equation shares a property with the thing it's a representation of. The sharing of properties is at the level of the relations among these things in systems. It's essentially holistic. This holism of representation is a lesson that the rationalists never forgot. Uh, it's central to Spinoza. It's central to uh, Leibniz. Uh, the empiricists never got it. They continue to think in atomistic terms uh, and as a result became skeptical about uh, whether we could ever know about representational uh, relations. <clears throat> Spinoza saw that what was doing the work in Descartes was that uh, there was a correspondence of structure and that meant that you could uh, find out about what was going on with the represented things by manipulating the representings of them. If you could solve algebraic equations, that could tell you things about uh, geometrical properties. Uh, one of Spinoza's notorious uh, slogans, uh, the one that was seized on by the Germans uh, uh, in the 18th century in the Spinozismus Streit, uh, Hen Kai Pan, uh, the one that is everything. Uh, that's the uh, holistic picture. Uh, and it's striking in Leibniz, whose notion of degrees of perception and infinite mirroring of monads is essentially holistic in the sense that if you make a difference anywhere, it makes a difference to everything. You know, he's trying to think about this uh, holistic. Uh, idea. So uh, the background that I think you know we need to keep in mind when we think from where we are now about representation uh, is this uh, conceptual sea change from an atomistic sort of concrete resemblance model as sharing of something like perceptible properties one by one uh, as the model of uh, the relation between appearance and reality, uh, the shift forced by the new science uh, to a much more abstract notion of representation uh, that's abstract in being holistic, looking at uh, the relation between representings and representatives in terms of the roles they play in systems that as, as whole systems can be mapped on uh, one to uh, another. Uh, so we have a notion of representation that essentially involves uh, global isomorphism rather than local resemblance uh, sharing. Uh, of properties. And I say this is broad brush strokes uh, to be sure, uh, but I think this is one of the big things that's happened. Um, and it's, it's really important to keep it in mind as we uh, look at what work the notion of representation is doing. It's been a tradition transforming notion. It's uh, in many ways definitive of modern philosophy as opposed to uh, earlier uh, uh, phases. Uh, all of this is uh, upstream of Rorty saying, well, and it, that idea has had its day. We should just do without this notion of representation uh, now. Uh, that's not going to be the line uh, I'm taking here. We need to understand it. And the hope is that we can use what we know now about reason relations in thinking about the global isomorphism that underwrites uh, representation relations. 
Oh, uh, let me pause there for comments or questions. Okay. Um, second point is uh, isomorphism isn't enough to get uh, representation. Uh, you need counterfactuals, counterfactual dependences, subjunctively robust dependences that induce the isomorphisms. Uh, you need what I'm going to call covariant tracking. And this is a point that uh, has come up in the history, as I'll talk about uh, in a minute, but uh, we're still sort of learning this lesson. Uh, uh, Putnam in the 60s and early 70s uh, argued this, uh, criticized the notion of isomorphism uh, as uh, a model of the relation between appearance and reality on the basis that any two physical things can be described in a way that makes them isomorphic. Uh, indeed, even if you describe one of them in a vocabulary, so you've got a whole bunch of facts about it, uh, you can always carve the other one up into spatiotemporal regions that you can map on so as to get a model of uh, the sentences that are describing uh, the other one. Uh, so he does this uh, model theoretically, uh, but the point is isomorphisms are cheap uh, because uh, if you're allowed to pick the vocabularies you use to specify things, you can always find uh, however many isomorphisms uh, you want. It's a different thing uh, if you have, in addition to an isomorphism, uh, a mechanism that's bringing about the isomorphism and maintaining it uh, so that subjunctive conditionals are true, where we say, well, if this bit were different, this other bit would be uh, different. Not only is there an isomorphism, but uh, the isomorphism is subjunctively robust. So we make those sort of tracking relations explicit with subjunctive conditionals. Uh, the world is ripe with these uh, lawful or at least subjunctively robust relations, the relation between the flagpole and uh, its shadow, uh, the relation between pressure and volume and temperature in the Boyle Charles law. Uh, there are all these tracking uh, relations. And some people have tried, some recent philosophers, Dretsky and Fodor, for instance, uh, to understand semantic representation just in terms of these tracking relations. Um, uh, and these are important. Uh, Leibniz, when he talked about maps, uh, understood the representation relation in terms of inferences. Uh, what it is for a map, for us to treat something as a map of a terrain uh, is to be willing to make inferences from map facts to terrain facts. So from the fact that there's a squiggly blue line in between these two dots, uh, we infer that uh, you have to cross a river to go from Pittsburgh to Columbus. Uh, treating it as a map is endorsing a set of inferences like that. Uh, knowing which facts about the map are map facts, that is representing facts, uh, and which not, so you don't make an inference from the coffee stain uh, on the map to anything about the terrain or from the margins uh, of it. Uh, you need to know which 
vocabulary you can specify facts about the map in such that you can infer things about the terrain uh, well uh, what's the difference between a map uh, which was made to be a representation uh, and I don't know that image of Jesus on your so on your toast in the morning, uh, or some uh, inscription that uh, the winds of Mars have made uh, in the sand that we can read as e equals m c squared. Uh, you know, you can find uh, an isomorphism, uh, but it's important about the map that we think if the terrain were different. The map would be different. Uh, that is, that the map was the result of a process uh, that induced the isomorphism, and that that process is one of tracking, uh, uh, or what Wittgenstein in the Tractatus calls a method of projection. Uh, picturing of object facts by name facts in uh, the Tractatus required a method of projection, uh, Wittgenstein says. And though he didn't worry about this, it turns out that projection in this sense has to include at least relations that are subjunctively robust of the form if the facts were or had been different, the representings would be or would have been different in systematic ways. I mean, insofar as, as the author of the Tractatus understood that, uh, because subjunctively robust relations like that aren't picturable, uh, you can't say what the method of projection is. That's something that can only be shown, uh, he thought. So uh, you could understand Wittgenstein is making up this notion of showing uh, because he didn't have a better semantics for subjunctive uh, conditionals. Anyway, my claim is that if we want to see uh, genuine representational relations, Static isomorphism isn't enough. Uh, you need some method of projection that underwrites uh, subjunctive conditionals uh, of the form if the representeds were different or had been different, uh, then the representings would be or would have been uh, different. Uh, this is what Fodor calls one way counterfactual dependence of horses, the representings, on horses. Uh, that if the horses were different, the horses uh, would be different in, uh, uh, in their inscriptions in a language of uh, thought. As I say, uh, semantic theorists uh, such as Dretsky and Fodor, tried to get a notion of representation entirely in these terms, entirely in terms of representings covariantly tracking uh, representants in the sense that they, the representings would have different properties if the representants had different properties. So we can put that in. Um, uh, subjunctive conditionals, that is, we can specify relations of covariant tracking in a lethic modal vocabulary. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. So isomorphism, global isomorphism that comes with it, a kind of holism, uh, it's the functional role in uh, a system, in a relational system that uh, we're going to need to look at in order to see representational relations. And then isomorphism isn't enough. 
Uh, we need these counterfactual or subjunctively robust uh, tracking relations, um, uh, bringing about and maintaining uh, the isomorphism. Third element I claim uh, comes from Kant. Uh, he was uh, entirely with Spinoza and the rationalists on looking to global uh, isomorphisms. Um, and he, more than any other of the early modern philosophers, uh, thought hard, made explicit what he meant by representation. That was his central uh, concept. Uh, indeed, uh, it's his word, Vorstellung, for um, representation, for what the others had been going on about. Descartes sometimes talks about representatio, but um, um, it really becomes canonical with Kant. But he's not only the philosopher of representations, he's the philosopher of rules. Uh, and while Spinoza was right, he thinks, uh, about the order and connection of things being the same as the order and connection of ideas, what Spinoza didn't understand, didn't appreciate, is the essentially normative character of the order and connection of ideas. Uh, that while the order and connection of represented things is, for Kant, articulated by rules in the form of laws of nature, expressible in alethic modal terms, the order and connection of ideas is an essentially normative order, articulated by rules specifying what conclusions one ought or is obliged to draw, what one has committed oneself to, and what would entitle one to it. Rules, Kant says, express relations of necessity, uh, natural and practical. Uh, those are the two species of necessity, natural necessity that we express in alethic modal vocabulary and practical necessity, the necessity that governs subjects rather than objects that we express in deontic modal vocabulary in terms of commitment and entitlement, uh, obligations, duties uh, 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 for him. Hegel, uh, looking at this view of Kant, uh, sees Kant as understanding an essential normative dimension of representation relations. Uh, Hegel sees Kant as adding the insight that representation is an essentially normative concept. Uh, what is represented by a representing is inter alia, what exercises a certain kind of authority over it. Uh, the represented by definition, sort of conceptually, provides the normative standard for assessments of the correctness of the representing just insofar as the representing counts as a representing of that represented. Uh, that is, it's being a representing of that represented is being responsible to what's represented precisely for assessments of uh, the correctness of the representing as a representing. Uh, Representings uh, are normatively governed by what's represented in the sense that they're essentially subject to a distinctive kind of normative assessment, assessment of their correctness as representings, and uh, 
to be what's represented by them is to play that normative role of being the authoritative normative standard governing uh, the correctness of the representing as a representing of that represented. So Kant says, if the mind consists of representings and this representational relation is essentially a normative uh, relation, then an absolutely essential philosophical task is understanding the nature of these normative uh, these normative relations. Uh, and it would take us too far afield, I think, to go into this, but um, this problematic is non-trivially related to um, Kant's innovation in thinking of normative vocabulary in deontic rather than axiological terms. So where the uh, ancients had thought in terms of the good uh, and values uh, and virtues, uh, Kant thinks in terms of duties and rights of commitments and uh, entitlements, uh, essentially of statuses of uh, subjects, uh, whereas the axiological view in terms of the good or of values uh, is thinking about the objective uh, norm uh, rather than the status of uh, the subjects. Uh, but as I said, I'm not going to... Uh, Go into that. Uh, I'm afraid the deontic normative meta vocabularies are going to get short shrift relative to the alethic modal ones. Uh, I'm not going to have space and time to to fill out the parallels, the compare and contrast, in the way I would like to. Uh, I will mention that. Um, What I didn't get around to talking about at the end last time, uh, you may remember from the handout, I had these sort of three sample pieces of practical reasoning, was an account of what makes something a bit of normative vocabulary in terms of the distinctive role in reasoning that it plays, uh, role in practical reasoning, uh, in uh, the expressive role characteristic of deontic vocabulary, is making explicit uh, patterns of practical reasoning. Um, and what I'll just register as part of the story that I'm not going to tell uh, is that uh, it's essential to uh, the social practices that are made explicit by normative vocabulary that um, normative vocabulary is socially perspectival. There's a distinction intrinsic to it between the concept context of deliberation and the context of assessment. The first person context of deliberation where practical reasoning has a conclusion, so I shall, uh, the, the bank employee says, so I shall wear a necktie, or so I shall not torture the helpless wanderer. Uh, but there's also the context, the third person or second person context of assessment, uh, where the conclusion of the sample bit of practical reasoning uses a should rather than a shall. Oh, I see. So because of that reason, you should do such and such. Uh, this relation between the uh, evidently normative should and the not evidently normative shall that just is uh, on the account I would like to give uh, an expression of the two different social perspectives of uh, normative vocabulary. Uh, this is a, a, a deep and resonant 
uh, connection between the shall and the should. But uh, I'm just not going to be able to uh, pursue it here. So much being, so little time. Um, yeah. So uh, the claims I've put on the table so far are, uh, look, representation is a new uh, notion. Uh, there was a big conceptual change from thinking in terms of categories of resemblance to thinking more abstract categories of representation. Uh, that notion of representation required uh, a notion of global isomorphism. Uh, it required a notion of covariant tracking, which is about processes or practices that uh, reliably uh, establish global isomorphisms and maintain them in a subjunctively robust uh, way. These are the, uh, the basis for the methods of projection uh, in uh, tractarian uh, terms. Uh, and then third, that uh, what uh, Dretsky and Fodor didn't appreciate, but teleosemanticists like uh, the queen of them all, Ruth Milliken, uh, but also uh, David Papineau and Kim Strelny. Uh, what they do appreciate is uh, uh, there is this normative dimension. Uh, and they want to get it from broadly selectional evolutionary uh, uh, evolutionary sources. Uh, another uh, long story uh, worth telling. Uh, but you know, I introduced this uh, as a Kantian insight uh, that uh, to be properly uh, intelligible as a notion of representation. Uh, you need to underwrite this normative dimension, the authority of representings uh, of representatives over uh, representings. And what I want to say next is to suggest that uh, that normative governance, uh, that matter of the um, represented serving as a standard for normative assessment of the correctness of the representing as a representing is what we need to add to uh, a covar covariant tracking process, introducing and maintaining uh, a global isomorphism to get a workable notion of representation. Oh, uh, yeah, let me. So I haven't talked about how to move to the notion of description. Uh, yet, uh, but uh, if we just think about uh, the relation between an ordinary empirical descriptive base vocabulary, uh, OED, uh, the cat is on the mat, uh, how does that relate to what it's about, to the cat being on the mat or not? Uh, it has a representation relation that has two parts. Uh, the representings have to covariantly track the representeds. That's something we can express using uh, subjunctive conditionals. If uh, the represented facts were different, the representings would be different. Of course, that's not 100% true, but it's insofar as that's true, uh, it's uh, a more or less robust representation relation. So uh, 
the representings must covariantly track the represented, and the representeds must normatively govern the representings uh, in that they must serve as normative standards for assessment of the correctness of the representings that count as representings of those representeds just insofar as it's those representeds that they're responsible to for uh, uh, their uh, correctness. So we can uh, see these relations of covariant tracking and normative governance. I'm suggesting where those both apply, uh, we can see a representation relation. A good thing to mean by representation is uh, where we have two systems that stand in this uh, reciprocal relation of covariant tracking of representatives and normative governance by representatives uh, on the part uh, of the representings. Well, let me pause there for comments or questions. Good. Um, can I? Yes, Ken. Um, I want to ask uh, how can the uh, reason relations at the uh, word corner? Um, that's the uh, um, the the reason relations uh, set by the elastic model uh, vocabularies. How can these reason relations uh, normatively govern the uh, re reason relations uh, at the uh, right side? Because that's from the word uh, word side. Right. Well, uh, I mean, my picture is going to be: we have to look at the discursive practice. We have to look at somebody who's taking or treating something as uh, a representing of uh, something else. Now that might be practitioners uh, who are using the language, or it might be us as theorists. Uh, so as semantic theorists, when we say uh, this dot on the map represents Pittsburgh, uh, what are we committing ourselves to? Uh, what, what are we saying when we say it uh, represents that? And I'm claiming we're saying two things. Uh, we're saying if, so, so let's say the fact, the map fact that this dot is square uh, represents the fact that uh, Pittsburgh is between a quarter of a million and a half a million in population. And we say, well, now, what are we saying when we make that claim using the term representation? Well, we're, we're committing ourselves to uh, a subjunctive conditional. If the facts about the population of Pittsburgh were different, then uh, this map fact would be different. It wouldn't be uh, a square. And that's the elite, that, that's the uh, covariant tracking side, and we're committing ourselves to uh, uh, a conditional that has a subjunctive antecedent. Uh, if the, the population of Pittsburgh were different, then this dot should be different. Uh, if the population were less than a quarter of a million, then it should be circular. If the population were more than half a million, then it should be triangular. Uh, we, in making the, the representation claim, are committing ourselves to both uh, of these. Now, uh, we may uh, at some point want to talk about uh, representation relations sort of in the view from nowhere, where, where we're not uh, looking at how we say it. But this is where we're going to start uh, in thinking about them. what it is for there to be a representation relation is for there to be a relation of covariant tracking and 
normative governance, uh, normative government, government. Um, and so, you know, that's what you have to argue if you argue that what you have to give reasons for if you want to uh, maintain that there's a representation relation. Uh, now, there may be other ways to uh, underwrite that uh, normative claim. But, you know, in the Kantian picture, it's in the eyes of somebody, somebody who claims the representation uh, relation. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, now I said that this notion of representation comes between Sellers' mere labeling and his describing, uh, as we were talking about them last time. And I'm thinking of uh, his mere labeling as involving only the covariant tracking. Uh, you know, the sort of thing that happens when um, uh, the rise in temperature brings about an increase in the length of the column of mercury in the thermometer. Uh, the length of the column of mercury is labeling. It's responding differentially to a stimulus. That's not describing yet. Uh, Sellers says. In the case of an artifact like a thermostat, we can say, oh, it really is representing uh, because there is a normative relationship. A properly functioning thermometer uh, is such that uh, if the uh, temperature were rising, the column of mercury would be lengthening because if the temperature is rising, the column of mercury should uh, lengthen. That's the way it was designed. That, that's what determines whether it's being a good uh, representing uh, or not. So there's the normative dimension as well as the um, tracking relation, which there isn't when, uh, you know, I squeeze the balloon down Oh, uh, and increase its pressure and decrease its volume and increase its temperature. All those things are tracking one another, but there isn't yet a representation relation. That's just uh, the way the world works. There's consequence relations uh, in virtue of which some things track uh, other things. But in the case of the Boyle-Charles law, oh, uh, I mean, we could treat uh, the relationship as normative as we do when we exploit it in building a mercury column thermometer. But in general, uh, when it gets colder and the volume of gas uh, decreases, that isn't a representation relation unless somebody gives it uh, a normative significance. It's just the world consists of these things that subjunctively uh, co-vary uh, and rule each other out. That's what we describe in polythic modal vocabulary. So if we think about that, uh, about covariant tracking as still mere labeling, uh, then representation sits between that and description. A paradigm of uh, a representation that sits in between them is the map. Uh, the map does not describe uh, Pittsburgh as being uh, as having a certain population, though it does underwrite an inference from a map fact to uh, uh, a terrain fact that exploits uh, the covariant tracking and normative governance. Uh, relations. What more do you need uh, to get description? Well, you need the representations to be situated in a space of implications and incompatibilities, uh, as Sellers says. That is, you need the representings to be a vocabulary, to stand in reason relations uh, to other things. That's conceptual representation, where the representing is uh, 
something that's conceptually contentful can serve as a premise and a conclusion in implication and incompatibility relations. So uh, we can see how to assemble the materials that we have here uh, into a notion of representation as uh, covariant tracking of represented by representings and normative governance of representings by represented. Uh, that's what we need for representation. And if in addition, the representings are uh, uh, vocabularies uh, standing in reason relations, uh, then uh, we have uh, real description, descriptive representation, where you represent by saying that, making it explicit, saying that the cat is on the mat, that's what you can do because the cat is on the mat, plays a position in this system of implications and incompatibilities. It has a conceptual role of the sort we can uh, make explicit in the implication space semantics. So here in this picture, uh, we've got these reason relations on both sides. And it's the fact that uh, the acceptables and rejectables stand in reason relations, these conceptual contents stand in reason relations that makes this a relation not just of representation, uh, but of description, of descriptive representation. Or we could say uh, descriptive representation is fact stating. Um, you're at least in the fact stating line of work if uh, you've got these uh, uh, you've got these relations. Um, you know, you, you may not succeed in stating a fact because what you said was false. Uh, even though there's a generally reliable tracking relation, and even though you're committed to things being this way, maybe they aren't. Maybe this is one of the cases where you got it wrong. But you are uh, in the fact stating line of work whether on this particular occasion your claim states a fact or merely some way things uh, could be. Now, where I'm going with all of this is here. Um, these two vocabularies don't just line up with the two poles of the intentional nexus, uh, as we see in bimodal conceptual realism, they also express the two essential sides of the representation relation. You use alethic modal vocabulary to make explicit relations of covariant tracking. If the representing were different, the represented would be, sorry, if the represented were different, the representing would be different. Uh, that's using subjective conditionals in alethic modal vocabulary. Whereas normative governance is specified in a deontic normative uh, vocabulary. Uh, I was talking about uh, authority and uh, responsibility because that's sort of the most natural uh, way to think in the uh, context in which Kant first sort of came up with the idea, realized, explicitly thematized this essential normative dimension of uh, representation, uh, but um, uh, but this is a you know a normative vocabulary that uh, same sort of antecedent subjunctive antecedent. If uh, the facts were different, 
then the claims ought to be different. Oh, that's an essential part of the claims representing the facts. Uh, it's not just if the facts were different, the claims would be different. That's the covariant tracking uh, that's instituting the um, and maintaining the isomorphism. Uh, but we've got rules that say how things ought to be. Uh, and if the cat were not on the mat or something incompatible with it, if the cat were swimming in the sea, uh, then you ought not to claim that uh, the cat is on the mat. It would not be correct uh, to claim that. So the phenomenon I'm interested in here is that the alethic and deontic modal vocabulary come into the story twice. They come into the story in the relations between They come into the story in our specifying the two poles of the intentional nexus, the objective side and the subjective side, the side of what's represented and the side of the representings of it. Uh, but they also come in in specifying the two sides, the, as it were, alethic modal side and the deontic normative side, of the representation relation between them. So the relation of these rational metavocabularies, alethic and deontic, oh, uh, the role they play in intentionality, in the relation between vocabularies and what the vocabularies are about, uh, is at least twofold. I mean, we'll see that you can actually turn this crank one more time. Um, these are intimately related vocabularies, two sides of one coin uh, in an intricate but uh, analyzable uh, way, which I'm claiming uh, gives us an insight into representation relations uh, from the point of view of these rational metavocabularies, that is vocabularies for making reason relations explicit. Why is that? Well, it's because Covariant tracking and normative governance in the case of descriptive representations are relations between the reason relations in these two different forms. So we want to use rational metavocabularies, that is, metavocabularies for making reason relations explicit in. Uh, understanding uh, these things. I mean, Insofar as there's anything to this line of thought, 
how it's really important to think about the relation between these two kinds of modal vocabulary, alethic and deontic. How the deontic modality as a modality, I mean, people recognize it as such. Uh, you know, you get logics of um, permission and obligation, permission, uh, diamond like, sort of possibility like, and obligation, uh, box like uh, one, uh, necessity type one. Uh, I adverted to this early on when I suggested that. Uh, you were really crippling yourself if you do that and then define uh, permitted as not obliged not and obligation as not permitted not. That is help yourself to a negation there uh, so as to make that a one-sorted deontic vocabulary instead of the two-sorted commitment and entitlement one. Um, but you know, people have seen this formal analogy uh, between alethic and deontic modalities. Um, but they haven't borne down, I think, uh, to try and understand uh, these the intricate relations between what is expressed in these two different vocabularies, uh, the structure of uh, intentionality. Oh, uh, Sellers got really close. And, and indeed, his remark that uh, modal vocabulary is a transposed language of norms. That's something he said. Um, and he meant, oh, uh, well, oh, uh, what in in the terms I'm I put it in last time, what you're doing in making a claim about what necessarily follows or what's impossible, uh, what you're doing is endorsing patterns of inference. Um, so there's that endorsement. Uh, he he saw that. Oh. Um, but I don't think, and his notion of picturing is the notion of um, covariant tracking as instituting um, and maintaining global isomorphisms. And he had the idea that it's rules living in the practices of uh, discursive practitioners that institute those picturing relations. He didn't divide things up the way I have, sort of tying those two things together into a notion of representation. Uh, he he dissembled a lot of the pieces here, but um, uh, maybe got the closest. And um, Paul Grice, a uh, brilliant uh, philosopher you know, with whom I disagree about just about everything he said in the philosophy of language, but you know, he really worked out uh, a point of view. It's individualist and it starts with uh, his notion of natural meaning starts with uh, intentional states instead of discursive practices. I think that's a uh, wrong way around, uh, but he's very good. Uh, but he spent the last decades, really, of his life uh, worrying about the relation between alethic and deontic uh, vocabularies. Uh, that was what he talked about in his Locke lectures. Uh, at Oxford, uh, and his are one of the few that sets of Locke lectures that weren't immediately published. Uh, indeed, 20 years went by, uh, and he died uh, not having published what he'd said there. 
Uh, it was published by uh, his students uh, under the title Aspects of Reason. And, uh, and it's a mess. Uh, I mean, you can see he, just, he did not get his thoughts pulled together. Um, but maybe a third of that book uh, is starting off from a completely different place uh, than I do here, uh, namely the linguistics, looking at the use of, for instance, must, uh, which we can use to express an alethic modal connection. Uh, if you uh, throw that rock, the glass must break. Uh, but also has the deontic normative, but, but you must drive her to the airport, you promised. Uh, and uh, should, uh, yeah, that uh, weight is light enough. The, the branch should support it. It probably won't break. Uh, that's an alethic uh, modal uh, one. And he claimed that this was the form that his uh, wrestling with it took, as I say, very different from uh, the line I'm articulating here, uh, was that there was actually one modal notion, an or modal notion of must, of should, of ought, uh, that we, not for no reason, but in the end, to our confusion, split into two uh, and thought of as having alethic and deontic species of that genus, where the thought he seemed to be after, and as I said, these I think the text is a mess, uh, but the thought he seemed to be after is these are inextricably intertwined aspects of one modal notion. Uh, and what he wanted to do was sort of pick it apart. I didn't get that much from uh, the Grice, uh, but he deeply worried about this problem, as I say, for decades. Uh, and somebody will be able to figure out sort of what he was, what he was after and, and how to make those uh, thoughts go, uh, but it probably isn't gonna be me. Uh, so anyway, that was all a very indefinite appreciation. Uh, but against the background of wanting to say, you know, we should be worrying about the relation between these uh, meta vocabularies of reason relations, uh, because they're the secret to the secret. Uh, they're the key to uh, understanding the representational dimension of. Uh, conceptual content, working our way out from uh, reason relations that is in an inferentialist order of explanation, but ideally uh, doing justice to uh, the representational dimension of description and fact state. Okay, well, maybe this is a good point for our break. Uh, like, let's take 15 minutes and come back at 2.35. Okay. <clears throat> Are there questions or comments uh, at this point? I mean, yeah, there's questions. I mean, is there anything formulable that uh, uh, you would like? I want to. Um, 
put this thing up here again. Um, <clears throat> think about how this could be simplified. If one just, instead of having the Aletheic and Deontic vocabularies, um, and instead of distinguishing these two aspects of uh, representation, one just talked representation talk. Uh, so between the base vocabulary, the, the descriptive, ordinary ground level, ordinary empirical descriptive vocabulary, and the world it's describing and representing, there's a single representation relation. Uh, and up here, we've got some vocabulary that we use to talk about representation, uh, the representation vocabulary that we use to specify this relation. There'd just be one thing. And I mean, that's the way people typically talk, uh, I guess. Uh, one way to think about what we're doing here is that we're unpacking that. Uh, we're saying that one notion of representation really essentially has these two aspects, uh, an alethic aspect and a deontic aspect. We can talk about them in these different vocabularies. And when we do, when we talk about the representation relation in these two different vocabularies, we see there's two sides, two things that need to be going on for there to be a proper representation relation. Uh, in the case we really care about, where um, the representings are a vocabulary, so this not at least the simplest sorts of maps, uh, this will be a relation between uh, the reason relations, we've taken that one notion of representation and that one sort of single representational semantic metavocabulary and split it into these two. Um, and, and that splits, as it were, the phenomenon, that lets us distinguish these aspects of the phenomenon. Um, if you think about the relation between ordinary descriptive vocabulary, uh, the frog is on the log, and uh, the world where the frog is uh, on the log. If you think about that as consciousness, not in a Chalmers lit up inside sentience sort of way, but in the side that matters for sapiens, for knowing or believing something about how things are, uh, then what we're talking about is uh, a more articulated vocabulary for understanding consciousness. That is, what you're seeing here is a form of conceptually articulated self-consciousness, consciousness about what consciousness consists in, uh, that we get to by splitting up uh, the notion of representation. And here it seems telling that uh, I didn't start the story here uh, bringing in Alethic and Deontic metavocabularies, uh, wheeling them in as deus ex machina, uh, just saying, okay, let me tell you uh, about this. These arose organically in our thinking about reason relations. Uh, in our thinking about the reason relations that in Ulf's isomorphism shows us that uh, we can see these reason relations as globally isomorphic to one another and can capture what they have in common as it were in here, in an implication space semantics for conceptual roles, for the roles these things play in uh, the, 
the structures that are globally isomorphic um, here. Uh, our first grip on reason relations was from the deontic normative side. Uh, we saw how to work with them with logic. Uh, we came to see uh, through Wolf's isomorphism that these same relations of consequence and incompatibility could be understood in the truth maker semantics uh, terms, uh, that is in terms of a representational uh, uh, semantics. So it was uh, with all that background uh, of understanding of uh, these two vocabularies that we bring them to bear here on the notion of representation to get this more uh, articulated uh, understanding. Covariant tracking, normative governance, that's what, those are the relations that institute and maintain the isomorphism at the level of reason relations that Wolf showed us how to talk about in these different rational meta vocabularies. Okay. Let me turn the crank one more time. Oh, and the story I'll be telling here is uh, more or less the story uh, from the essay in the reading called Modal Expressivism and Modal Realism Together Again. Uh, that is, let me remind you, uh, I wanted to understand um, these rational meta vocabularies as versions of what Kant was after with his notion of categories, um, as concepts whose expressive job is not in the first place to describe and state matters of empirical fact. Uh, that's what the OED vocabularies do. Uh, but rather to make explicit uh, features of the framework that makes description and explanation of empirical goings on possible. Uh, a lethic modal vocabulary is to do that, and deontic normative vocabulary is to do that. That's the expressive role in virtue of which they're meta vocabularies uh, really for any descriptive vocabularies. Um, not clear, for instance, that the Alethic modal vocabulary applies to mathematical vocabularies. Um, if it does, it does only in a degenerate uh, way, whereas the deontic one uh, does seem to apply uh, to all of them. Now, remember, I said that um, as I read him, Seller's big epiphany was reading his hero Carnap and seeing Carnap as having a notion of. Kantian categories, but having also the innovation of understanding that in metalinguistic terms. And that that was the point at which the scales fell from Seller's eyes and he felt he could go forward with the new way of words. Uh, that was neo-Kantianism transliterated into uh, a metalinguistic uh, vocabulary. Um, but that Sellers wrestled uh, 
really for his whole life with uh, trying to reconcile that story about um, Alethic modal vocabulary uh, with the sort of obvious counterfactuals that uh, what you say in the modal vocabulary would still be true, even if there had never been any vocabularies, never been any languages, no language users, uh, certainly no English or German uh, language users. So, you know, when he says, I want to understand the claim that all A's are B's, that copper necessarily melts at 1084 degrees C, uh, as endorsement of a rule of inference, as subjunctively robust, uh, we can't understand that as being about those words. Um, now we can do something with conceptual roles uh, from that. But I suggested at the beginning of wisdom is to use Seller's own notion of a pragmatic meta vocabulary and see him as having given us an account of what you're doing in making what he calls firsthand use of Alethic modal vocabulary. What you're doing when you say, when you claim that copper necessarily melts at 1084 degrees C, what you're doing is endorsing a pattern of inference uh, from statements about the temperature to statements about uh, its state as liquid or solid. That's what you're doing when you make such a claim. In the way that uh, what I'm doing when I say you shouldn't do that, using should, uh, a bit of deontic normative vocabulary, is disapproving of what you're doing. Uh, the expressivists about normative vocabulary are right if you understand what they're saying as couched in a pragmatic meta vocabulary, a vocabulary for talking about what you're doing in talking. The trouble is sellers like the meta ethical expressivists that he criticized uh, didn't explicitly have that, uh, didn't explicitly put his claim in terms of pragmatic meta vocabularies, like the meta ethical expressivist, he thought he was saying what you're saying when you say that copper necessarily melts at uh, this temperature or that you should not do that. Uh, and I suggest the beginning of wisdom is to keep separate books here to see us as having learned something crucial about the use of the expression uh, when we give these uh, analyses, uh, but to understand that is something we would say in a pragmatic meta vocabulary, uh, that is in one that uses deontic normative uh, vocabulary, uh, rather than as saying what you're saying, what the conceptual content of your claim is. Uh, now, maybe the meta-ethical expressivists are right uh, that what's distinct, one of the distinctive things about normative vocabulary is that it isn't fact stating. It isn't describing anything. Uh, all it's doing is performing this pragmatic function. Maybe they're right. Uh, I mean, the historically what marked the difference between first wave meta-ethical expressivism of uh, Ayer and C.L. Stevenson and second wave meta-ethical expressivism of uh, Gibbard and Blackburn is that people appreciated the force of what Geach called the Frege argument and what everybody since then has called the frege Geach argument that um, there must be something that you're saying when you say uh, you should not do that. 
that's not just a matter of the force of the utterance, because uh, you can embed these things as, uh, for instance, consequence of conditionals. Uh, if repeating the gossip would harm someone to no good purpose, then you should not repeat the gossip. Uh, now, that was a conditional. Uh, I haven't endorsed anything or disapproved of anything. Uh, and yet that uh, sentence, you should not do that, uh, appeared there. Uh, the Geach argument uh, uh, he makes very crisply, it, it's a paradigm uh, philosophical move. Uh, he introduces this lovely uh, archaic English expression, macarize. Uh, and if you look it up in, a, you know, in the OED, not the ordinary empirical descriptive, but in the Oxford English Dictionary, you'll find macarize means to characterize someone as happy. And so he said, well, suppose I had the theory that in macarizing someone, one wasn't describing them. There is no fact that one was attempting to state. Rather, what you're doing in doing it is macarize, sorry, is macarizing them. So uh, um, when you say someone's happy, the claim is, you're not describing them, uh, not attributing a property to them, not attempting to state a fact. You're doing something else. You're macarizing them. They say, well, what are the rules for this game? Uh, couldn't I say when I say that something, that the stop sign is red, I'm not uh, describing it or fact stating, I'm doing something else, I'm rosifying it, uh, say? Uh, well, uh, we can tell that uh, in macarizing someone, you're also describing them because we can say, uh, uh, if it's his birthday, then he's happy. Uh, and now I haven't macarized him. I haven't said he is happy. Uh, I've just said, if today were his birthday, he would be uh, happy. Uh, that embedding it in the conditional strips off any force that my saying it has, uh, and yet we can still understand it. Uh, it still stands in reason relations. So he says, uh, with a normative vocabulary, like he should do it, I could say, if that would cause needless suffering, then he should not do it. Uh, that embeds, I haven't approved or disapproved. We need something more than the boo hurrah theory of normative vocabulary. And as I say, this, um, criterion of adequacy of being a meta-ethical expressivist was fully taken on board by people like Gibbard and Blackburn over the last 30 years. Uh, and they crafted uh, versions of expressivism that uh, explicitly deal with this uh, embedding um, uh, objection, uh, which, which really does go to the core of that uh, explanatory strategy. Uh, but this was all before, I mean, this all happened after Sellers uh, uh, was writing. Uh, he never sort of sorted things uh, out. Uh, Blackburn, by the way, I mentioned his human expressivism about the three M's, about morals, modals, and mathematics. Uh, he wanted to tell. Uh, he wants to tell a parallel story uh, about lethic modal vocabulary and uh, normative vocabulary. And also mathematical vocabulary, from my point of view, may be a step too far. Um, uh, at any rate, he meant to be supplying the want uh, that I'm complaining about in uh, Sellers. But suppose we say that Sellers was right about what you're doing in making firsthand use. And so that firsthand use is not embedded you know, as a freestanding utterance uh, as the principal operator in the sentence you're doing. That's making firsthand use of these expressions. So you know, he was being careful about that. Uh, suppose we say that he's right. 
that in doing that, in making firsthand use of these modal expressions, one is endorsing uh, a pattern of reasoning as uh, subjunctively robust, it's made explicit by um, subjunctive uh, conditionals. Um, suppose we say that, what should we say about what you're saying when you make firsthand use of these expressions? We have a good account of what you're doing. That's the expressivist account. What are you saying? And I think there's good reason to want to say you're stating modal facts. Uh, you're describing uh, impossibilities and necessities in the natural world. That's certainly what uncritical natural law talk uh, takes to be going on. Uh, in talking about what's necessary, you're describing a feature that the world really has. Uh, you're stating modal facts. I mean, I think a modal realism like this would have three parts. Uh, some modally qualified claims are true. Uh, the modally qualified claims that are true state facts, and at least some of those facts are objective in the sense that they're independent of the activities of concept users, would be facts even if there had never been vocabulary users. And I think there's good reason to endorse all those claims. You know, physics says things like two bodies acted upon only by gravitational forces necessarily attract one another in direct proportion to the product of their masses and in inverse proportion to the square of the distance from their cent between their centers of mass. I mean, I take it that that's true. Oh, modulo various quantum and relativistic claims, certainly claims like that uh, are true. Uh, denying that, I think, involves contradicting things physicists say with good reason. Uh, that would take a really strong argument. Uh, and Sellers remind us, uh, uh, let me remind us, it says, because physics and the sciences generally are not just in the business of describing things, they're in the business of using some descriptions to explain others as reasons for others. And it's that feature of the framework of description and explanation that's made explicit by um, um, alethic modal vocabulary. We really don't want to say, uh, unless there's just no alternative, oh, well, those modal relations of necessity and impossibility uh, are empirically real, but transcendentally ideal. Uh, I mean, that's what Kant felt obliged to say, given uh, his understanding of the categories. We would really rather not say that. Uh, we'd rather take there to be true modal claims uh, that state facts. I mean, if they're true modal claims, they do state facts, at least in the Phrygian sense. He says, a fact is a thought that is true, meaning by thought, not a th an episode of thinking, but something thinkable. Um, there can be unthought facts. Uh, but, you know, this is the sense uh, of fact that Wittgenstein is invoking when he says, oh, uh, when we say and mean that such and such is the case, we and our meaning don't stop anywhere short of the fact that we mean this is so. Uh, on that usage, if there are true modal claims, then there are modal facts. Uh, and that these are objective, uh, independent of us, 
Well, that's certainly the picture of, as I say, claiming, well, but in a transcendental sense, these are ideal. They depend on uh, us. That's crucial Copernican revolutionary feature of the Kantian story, but it's almost literally unbelievable. Uh, it, it is uh, not a position we want to be in. Uh, McDowell in Mind and World takes this as a criterion of adequacy. We may not be obliged to say that. I have a tiny little argument that I'm attached to, which is probably in, in the end silly, but I am attached to it, so I'm going to trot it out. Um, and that is that uh, in one of the great, in the work that uh, is the basis of one of the great conceptual transformations in physics uh, in the 20th century, uh, Emmy Neuther uh, proved uh, in general how to go back and forth between statements of symmetry uh, and laws relating uh, variables. And in particular, the Neuther theorem, her uh, great theorem entails uh, that a fundamental temporal symmetry in statements of laws of nature, that uh, the laws of nature are the same no matter what time it is, uh, is mathematically equivalent to the physical principle of the conservation of energy. Uh, conservation of energy and the laws of physics not changing over time. Those are two ways, classical physics now, those are two ways of saying the same thing. Um, so if uh, modal claims, all of them, depended on the existence of vocabulary users, uh, then those statements would not be uh, temporally symmetrical. Uh, there would be a difference before and after there were speakers. Uh, but that would be a violation of the conservation of energy. Uh, and we ought not to be in the business of arguing the physicists are wrong about that. Uh, I mean, there are some reasons from the bleeding edge of physics to think conservation of energy might not be exceptionless, but that's not really where we are. Uh, physics is committed to the laws of nature not having changed when there were uh, vocabulary users. Uh, and we should not lightly uh, contradict them on points like that. Further, we've seen <clears throat> this uh, Spinozist principle, omnis determinatio est negatio, uh, every determination is an exclusion, uh, a negation. To say that there is some objective way the world is, is already to commit yourself to necessary conditions of necessary consequence and impossibility. What it is for uh, the cat being on the mat to be a determinate way the world could be uh, is for it to exclude various other things about the cat. It excludes the cat swimming in the ocean uh, at the same time. Uh, it excludes the cat being a cloud of gas uh, at the time. Those things are impossible. They're incompatible with the cat being on the mat. Um, to see the world as uh, consisting of objective ways things could be uh, is to commit yourself to these uh, claims that we make in the modal uh, vocabulary. So can we do that? Can we entitle ourselves to uh, an account of what modal claims say, uh, given that's compatible with the expressive account of what you're doing in making modal claims, uh, making first um, hand use of them. 
And I claim that with our picture of what representation and descriptive fact stating consist in, we can. We know what we need to show in order to understand alethic modal metavocabularies as fact stating, as describing modal facts, conceptually representing the world as being a certain way. We need to show covariant tracking by modal claims, subjunctive conditionals paradigmatically, of modal relations of incompatibility, of consequence and incompatibility. Uh, that is, we've got to show that uh, at least when all's going well, uh, if the necessary consequences and impossibilities in the world had been different, we would have endorsed different subjunctive conditionals. Well, that's what scientific practice is doing. I mean, we do it in everyday life. Uh, if uh, there's traffic on the boulevard of the allies, then uh, she'll probably be late uh, for class. Uh, there's a subjunctive conditional. Uh, and we've worked hard to make those things track uh, that actual uh, subjunctive robustnesses and impossibilities and necessities, uh, covariant tracking of uh, necessary relations of consequence and relations of impossibility or incompatibility. Uh, that's the first element of descriptive representation. Second element, normative governance of modal claimings by actual relations of necessary consequence and impossibility. That is, if uh, the modal facts were different, uh, if uh, the law of gravitation were an inverse cube law instead of an inverse square law, as far as distance is concerned, uh, then one ought to claim that uh, uh, it's an inverse cube law instead of an inverse square law. Uh, yeah, there's normative governance of uh, our lethic modal claims by uh, the facts. And then modal vocabulary has to be a vocabulary uh, whose principal role is expressed to express reason relations of the base OED vocabulary, but uh, can, you know, it's these conceptual contents state ways the world uh, could be. Uh, that is the representings in this case are conceptually articulated. So it's not just that alethic modal vocabulary can represent uh, the reason relations uh, uh, in the world, but can actually describe or state them. Uh, and that's compatible with seeing it as playing an expressive role relative to base vocabularies, uh, which we would describe in pragmatic, uh, in a pragmatic meta vocabulary. Uh, it's compatible. Uh, with that. Now, as you'll see in this picture, I want to say, and the same thing goes mutatis mutandis for deontic normative vocabulary. That is, uh, we can see it also, our talk about what people are committed and entitled to as covariantly tracking the reason relations uh, among the concepts of a base vocabulary and those reason relations among the base vocabulary normatively governing our talk uh, in the deontic normative meta vocabulary. Uh, we've got a vocabulary up here, so it can be uh, standing, so, so it has representings that are conceptual contents, uh, and that's what's needed for descriptive representation, not just 
uh, representation. So uh, where I'm ending up is turning this crank one more time. Uh, we said before that uh, alethic modal and deontic normative vocabularies come into the story twice uh, in specifying in making explicit reason relations uh, in the world, in the truth maker semantic meta vocabulary, and uh, reason relations within the vocabulary, in the deontic normative vocabulary, according to uh, Ulf's uh, isomorphism and that reading of bimodal uh, conceptual realism, but also in. Uh, letting us explicitly express the two halves of the representation relation, covariant tracking in lethic modal terms and normative governance in deontic uh, terms. But now we're saying they come in uh, yet again when we understand uh, the descriptive fact stating aspect of the conceptual contents conferred on things in by the reason relations in alethic modal vocabulary and in deontic normative vocabulary. I mean, you're going to use the alethic vocabulary to describe the covariant tracking uh, of the uh, of the reason relations in OED vocabulary by the deontic normative. You're going to use the deontic normative vocabulary to specify normative governance, both in its own case and in the case uh, of alethic modal vocabulary. So these vocabularies are going to come into the story now three times. Uh, but uh, I mean, four times if we think about them specifying these relations of normative governance and covariant uh, tracking. Uh, but this structure allows us both to say what you're doing in making firsthand use of these rational uh, meta vocabularies and what you're saying by doing that. Uh, in the same way that we can say uh, in using base vocabulary, what you're doing, you're committing yourself, you're precluding yourself from being entitled, uh, and so on, and what you're saying uh, when you do that. You're saying that the cat is on the mat, that things are uh, thus and so, which we understand in terms of the conceptual role uh, semantics. There's still a big difference between the OED base vocabulary and these meta vocabularies, because there is no vocabulary that stands to the base empirical descriptive vocabulary as it stands to these two meta vocabularies. They are meta vocabularies. They depend on the reason relations um, uh, in expressible in other uh, vocabularies. Um, So that's what I have epitomized here uh, in the conclusion on the handout. Uh, we use the we use the alethic and deontic modal vocabularies to characterize the two poles of the intentional nexus, uh, the world and the vocabularies, the objective and the subjective poles. Uh, that's what we saw in that very first uh, diagram. Uh, then we want to understand covariant tracking and normative governance as adding up to representation. Uh, but in the third move, uh, we characterize those tracking and governance relations uh, in alethic and deontic modal vocabulary. Uh, that's what we see in the third diagram. Uh, and they come in again 
in stating a lethic modal and deontic normative facts. Uh, that's that fourth diagram that lets us say that the vocabularies are both meta vocabularies and descriptive and fact stating in a way that's derivative from and dependent on there being meta vocabularies. That's why they're different from ground level vocabularies. That's why they're rational meta vocabularies, but nonetheless, in a sense in which uh, that's intelligible in terms of uh, covariant tracking, normative governance, and the representings being vocabularies. Okay, well, uh, that's the story about the representational dimension of conceptual content. Uh, I mean, I should say a lot more than the practically nothing that I've said about how all that, all the things I just said about the lethic modal vocabulary look on the side of um, the antignormative vocabulary. Uh, it's a, I've given really short shrift to that. Here, here's one thing that I'll say. Um, people worried about the metaphysics and ontology of the norms. Um, are often disturbed uh, saying, well, you know, for the physical stuff, we can causally interact with it. And so, for instance, can perceive the colors and shapes of things. And the trouble with these spooky normative things is that uh, they don't exert forces, they don't have masses, they don't interact with us causally, uh, we can't perceive them. Uh, so someone like Harmon says the best explanation of our uh, normative talk is not to postulate that there really are these values. Uh, I think it makes a big difference at this point that we talk deontically, that there aren't really commitments Gil, is that what you're going to say? Uh, you know, there are these statuses. If you understand them as social statuses, of course there are. Uh, but specifically on the notion of perceiving them. Uh, this is an issue that uh, back in the, in McDowell's intellectual prehistory, uh, back when he and Gareth Evans were harassing Davidson in Oxford when Davidson came to give his Locke lectures. How one of the things they were objecting to, particularly John was objecting to, was Davidson's picture of languages as just noises, just the lexicon. Uh, and John's view, so Davidson said, look, what you can literally hear is just the noise somebody's made. And John was concerned to claim uh, that no, you could hear what somebody meant. Uh, if you were in your native language and nothing funny was going on, uh, you hear what they're saying, you hear what they mean, the content first. And you actually only hear the noises if there's some issue about it. Uh, I mean, this is why you know, if you're genuinely bilingual, you may not be able to remember what language somebody said something to you in. You remember what they told you, 
Uh, but even remembering whether they said it in English or in German, uh, not so easy. But uh, meaning is a normative concept. Uh, to hear what somebody means is to hear it as committing them to some other things, as entitling them to some other things. How is that intelligible? Well, John, in his way, just says, well, it is. What, what makes you skeptical uh, about that? Uh, but we might want more than that. You say, well, uh, can we responsively uh, apply normative terms in a way that covariantly tracks the normative situation? And here John has something helpful to say. He says, Yes, if you're a competent user of uh, thick moral concepts, thick normative concepts, but, but let's even say moral ones, like cruelty, that includes being able to see it. Uh, when Nietzsche saw the cart horse being beaten to death, uh, he didn't just see the rise and fall of the stick the guy was beating the horse with. He didn't just hear the anguished howls of the tormented horse. He saw the cruelty of what uh, the guy was doing. And if he couldn't, it would mean he had not been properly brought up, uh, didn't have full mastery of the concept of cruelty. Um, we can uh, covariantly track uh, normative phenomena. Well, in the theory of perception, these are affordances. Like what it's appropriate to do with the door handle, turn it to open the door. That's what you see first is how it's appropriately used, the normative feature of it. You first see the post box as a place it's appropriate to deposit mail to be uh, taken away. That's every bit as fundamental as sort of the secondary qualities. So uh, in an account like this uh, of representation, we can get you know, what I've talked about as a two-ply account of observation that uh, here we would say, well, uh, are you covariantly tracking it by reliable differential responsive dispositions? Well, yes, you can be in that relation to normative states of affairs. Uh, do they normatively govern you know, the correctness of your calling it cruel and so on? Yes, uh, they can do that. Are you applying the concepts to it, not merely recoiling uh, or interfering with the guy, but uh, describing what he's doing as being cruel? Yes. You're deploying a vocabulary uh, for doing that. You can not only state normative facts, you can observe them. Uh, normative states of affairs, under at least some circumstances, are perceptible. Uh, I mean, I should say by this same account, I take it that when a physicist looks in a bubble chamber and says, that's a mu meson. And I look and I only see a hooked vapor trail. Uh, but she's applying the concept mu meson. She need not be inferring that from the vapor trail. In this account, she's reliably differentially responding to the presence of the mu meson. Well, in these circumstances, but there's a reliably covariant causal chain connecting her to it. Which thing is she describing? Not the vapor trail. She's describing the particle. On my account, she sees the particle. Now, that's sort of counterintuitive. I don't see it. I have to infer it from the vapor trail. But she actually literally sees it even though, as we want to say, it's too small to see. Um, 
she has an observational relation to it uh, that's mediated by this uh, machine, but this measuring instrument, but everything is in that sense mediated by the states of your retina, and that's not what you see. What determines what you see is uh, farther down, um, is distal in these causal chains, and how distal it, it is in a reliably uh, covariant chain, causal chain uh, depends on what concept you apply. That's what decides how far out you go. Well, that's all uh, an aside, and you might well think that's a bridge too far, that's um, drawing the implausible consequences of this way of uh, thinking. Uh, but thinking about representation and so observation reports uh, from the point of view of the reason relations that make the concepts have the content they do, uh, uh, anyway, opens the way up for us to entitle ourselves to talk in these ways, which you may or may not want to uh, entitle yourself to. Okay, are there comments or formulable questions? Okay. Uh, let me remind you, uh, our next meeting is in two weeks. Uh, American Thanksgiving is next week, and we won't be uh, meeting. Uh, I have uh, some non-technical, but uh, I hope enjoyable material to present uh, next time. Uh, I'll give you a sort of dog and pony show uh, with this computer program that we have uh, written. It's non-technical, but uh, uh, I hope you'll uh, hope you'll enjoy it. There there will be toys um, uh, in any case, um, and then the final one. I will try and sort of pull things uh, in the final meeting. Pull things uh, together in a uh, in a conclusion. Uh, but I, I hope um, it seems that this iteration of the last two weeks which goes beyond what's gonna be in our book, uh, by the way, that this is not, uh, this is not part of that uh, project, uh, but uh, it's meant to show that uh, inferentialist approaches to semantics and representational ones that pragmatics first and semantics first orders of explanation really can coexist without uh, turning into a dualism, uh, a distinction becoming a dualism there, because we can see what the relations between them are, and that there's some real prospects for um, articulating aspects of uh, representational relations by looking at them from the point of view of uh, rational meta vocabulary, specifically aletheic and deontic, uh, modal ones uh, that we're not seeing if we start inside uh, truth maker semantics or its uh, forebear uh, possible worlds uh, semantics. Uh, we're, we're bringing something to the party in understanding representation relations, in understanding what it is for some state of the world to be a truth maker of uh, a sentence uh, or a false maker uh, of it. Okay, well then uh, I will see you in two weeks.